Three minutes to show time. Distinguished participants, uh, before we start, I kindly ask all participants who are not speakers to switch off their cameras uh, and microphones. Я попрошу всех, кто не выступает, выключить ваши микрофоны. And also, I would like to kindly ask all speakers to maintain a moderate pace at all time as we have translation during the meeting. Участников говорить в умеренном темпе, так как ведется синхронный перевод. The Russian channel need the Russian speaker needs to be in the Russian channel, please. Um, not uh, on the open floor. Thanks. Um, you need to switch. You need, you need to switch into the Russian, Russian channel, please. Russian channel. You're on the in, on the open floor right now. Okay. It says the Russian channel right now. Um, uh, hold on. Okay. Who's who's this? This is uh, the Russian interpreter speaking. Which one? Which one? Constantine. Constantine, hold on. Okay, I'm switched to Russian it's channel. The, it says Constantine. It says you. It says you're not. Uh, um, hold on, you're not in. You're using your Yahoo address. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna update. Okay, say something. One, two, three, four, five. I'm in the Russian channel. No, no, it says you're not, you're still not in the Russian channel. Give it a second. Somehow you, did you, did you rejoin okay. for some reason? No, I went back uh, to English and I'll just switch right, back to you, Russian. Could, could you do control shift C please? Okay. Can you hear me now? I hear you still on the open floor. Uh, oh, no, now I can hear you. Yes. Say something. One, two, three, four, five, Russian channel. Nope, you're not in the Russian channel. Give me a second. Okay.
one. No. Yeah, I can hear me. One, one. No, hold on. I'm just going to stop this for a second. Okay, say. One, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. I'm in the Russian channel. Yeah. Am I? No, you're still on the floor. Says you're in the Russian channel. I'm selecting Russian on my end. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um. But okay. You're 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 speaking over the 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 um moderator. So could somebody just speak in a Chinese channel really quickly for me, please? Okay, yes, yes, I hear you in the Chinese channel. So I'm not sure what's going on with your Russian channel, uh, Konstantin. Uh, could you log out, Konstantin, and come back in again? Okay. All right, thanks. Okay, uh, Ekaterina, go ahead, please. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Ekaterina Sfiladze, Deputy Public Defender of Georgia. Uh, uh, sorry, Peter, I hear Russian, and I think yeah. that there is a still technical problem. Sorry. Yeah, unfortunately, it's working perfectly. Started to. Um, I'm going to end the translation for a second. Um, give it a sec. I'll do a refresh. Okay, this is the Russian interpreter speaking into the Russian channel. C'est l'interprète russe ici qui s'exprime sur le canal russe. Okay. okay. Um, no, we're still hearing you on the floor. So um, you still hear me you, on the floor? I'm still hearing you on the floor. The only person that was working properly was a Chinese for some strange reason. Um, Are you have the same problem with French? Hold on one second. Could somebody say something in the French channel, please? French, French, French is working. French is working fine. Wait, uh, French is working fine. Chinese is working fine. Yeah, uh, Constantine, did you log off? I log off and I log back in again. Okay. Yeah, and I can hear myself on the English channel. Uh, do we hear Yulia on the Russian channel? Or she's not? Yes. Can't hear her either. This is Yulia on the Russian channel? No, it's not working. Yeah, same problem. I can hear Yulia on the floor as well. Constantine, can you just say something real quick? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, I have you. It's fine now. I have you. Uh, uh, and say say again. One, two, three, four, five. I'm supposed to be on the Russian shell. Yeah, I'm hearing you in Russian and English, so I'm not sure what's going on. You are you connected more than once? No, I have yeah. only one connection on my computer. Yeah, I hear you in the Russian channel, and uh, I'm also hearing you on the, the English, the open floor. So I'm not sure. You, can you just not say anything for a second, please? All right, let's let's continue, Katrina. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ekaterina Skiladze, Deputy Public Defender of Georgia. It is a great honor for me to moderate this very important interministerial dialogue. On behalf of the co-sponsors of this event, the United Nations Population Fund, the European Commission, and the Government of Norway, I present to you the first ever interministerial dialogue on sound preference and gender bias sex selection. 
The event is organized by the Gender and Human Rights Branch of the Technical Division of UNFPA in collaboration with the UNFPA Asia Pacific and Eastern Europe and Central Asia Pacific Regional Offices. I would like to also underline that this event is part of the 65th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. This platform provides an excellent opportunity to delegates and policymakers to position uh, that some preference and gender bias sex selection is a critically harmful practices. Today's event aims at strengthening uh, advocacy and visibility of the ongoing commitments of the following member states. Armenia, Azerbaijan, Bangladesh, China, Georgia, Nepal, and Vietnam. Before this very important day, has, uh, there has also been brainstorming and negotiations at government levels, resulting to proposed actions which will be highlighted later on. It is a gr great pleasure for me to present honorable speakers of today's event, representatives of academia, from whom we shall be learning a lot about the global status of some preference and gender bias sex selection. Honorable ministers and deputy chair, respectively from member states, Azerbaijan, Bangladesh, and Nepal. We will be hearing the global experience from South Korea and China and performance by our young advocate, singer and performer from China. Let me welcome all distinguished participants of this crucial event, be it ambassadors and representatives of permanent missions and other delegates. I hope we'll have very fruitful discussion today, which will bring tangible results in the future. We have questions and answers slot, and please note all your questions and suggestions will be taken into consideration, just in case there might be sufficient time to address them today. Kindly put them on the chat box and UNFPA team will track and respond to some of them directly on the chat box. Um, dear participants, while posting information about this event in social networks, we kindly ask you to use the following hashtag and some preference. Um, now I will humbly request the speakers deliver strictly the time allocated to you, considering that there is a lot to be accomplished with one hour and 15 minutes. At the outset, let me apologize in advance for mispronouncing your names. Let me open the event with uh, opening remarks, which will be delivered by the honorable guest, Ms. Henrietta Geiger and His Excellency, Mr. Doug Inge Ulstein. Ms. Henrietta Geiger is the Director of People and Peace uh, Directorate at the European Commission. Implementing the European Commission's development cooperation on human redevelopment including migration, security, gender equality, human rights, education, and health. Ms. Geiger held position in the European Union's Council of Ministers, the United Nations General Secretariat, as well as private sector and NGOs. Please join to welcome Ms. Geiger in delivering the opening remarks. Ms. Geiger, uh, please, floor is yours. We передаем him slower, Ms. Geiger. <sighs> Uh, I think Ms. Geiger has some technical difficulties to join this event, so I will move to our next speaker. Uh, and uh, let me introduce His Excellency, Mr. Daging Ulsten, Minister of International Development of Norway. And Mr. Ulsten is a Norwegian politician who has appointed in January 2019 as Minister of International Development in Norway's current government. And uh, after uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Ulsten, uh, if Ms. Geiger will join us, we will give floor to her for the opening remark. Mr. Ulsten, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and thank you for inviting me to participate in, in this important discussion. Let me also thank the UNFPA for their tireless efforts to protect the rights of girls and for putting a spotlight on the practice gender-based sex selection, also known as a sound preference. Harmful practices normally affect girls the most, and they have in common that they reflect a lesser value ascribed to girls and women compared to boys and men. The practices may have different root causes, but are always rooted in gender inequality and discriminatory norms. Fighting harmful practices is, is a personal conviction for, for me, as well as a priority 
for my government. Norway has stepped up its efforts against harmful practices. And one year ago, we launched a, a new international strategy to that effect. The strategy builds on our long standing engagement towards ending female genital mutilation. It includes new and stronger commitments against child marriage and son preference. With this strategy, we not only continue, but strengthen our engagement against harmful practices. We stand fully behind SDG 5, including SDG 5.3. Our ambition is for every girl to live her life without being subjected to harmful practices. I know I share this ambition with all of you present here today, but our common ambition must not stop there. We should not only protect girls from discriminatory and harmful practices, but provide opportunities for girls to develop and utilize their full potential, both as girls and later in life as, as women. In order to succeed in our joint endeavor, we need targeted efforts, both against harmful practices and against gender bias sex selection. And we need broad in, in investments in education, global health, gender equality and job creation, benefiting women and, and girls. Boosting the status, opportunities and empower girls and women are needed if we are to stand any chance of combating some preference. To your question about what motivate, uh, motivated us to participate in UNFPA's programs and efforts against harmful practices, the answer is, is clear. We simply cannot accept that girls continue to be at risk of being subjected to these practices. Harmful practices are about equality or rather lack of equality. Harmful practices are, are forms of violence that have severe physical and mental health consequences for the girls and women being subjected to this unacceptable abuse. Harmful practices are a serious barrier to women and girls' ability to continue their education as well as participate in, in and contribute to society. But they not only harm individuals, they also hamper development. Girls' access to health, education and work contributes to the welfare and development of families and communities. Abolishing harmful practices is therefore of direct interest also to boys and men who must be mobilized in support of gender equality and be part of our efforts. I was happy to join the 2019 Nairobi Summit marking the 25th anniversary of the International Conference on Population and Development. And Norway pledged 760 million Norwegian krona to eliminate harmful practices over a four year period. And this is part of a pledge to spend 10.4 billion Norwegian krona, more than $1 billion in order to promote sexual and reproductive health and rights from 2020 to 2025. We know that the road to eliminating the practice is long. And now the COVID-19 crisis is making this road even longer. So COVID-19 is reinforcing existing inequalities it is a health crisis, but it's also an economic and social crisis. And we know that the consequences hit women and girls hard in many parts of the world. As the pandemic threatens to roll back hard earned achievements, if I could say so, it means we must work harder and Norway remains committed in this endeavor. In order for us to succeed, we must work together with other governments, with the UN, with civil society, and at least with the girls who are at risk from harmful practices. I am so encouraged to see that so many countries now join forces and I look very much forward to hear about their experiences. And I applaud the initiative you have taken to have a ministerial declaration and Norway remains committed. So thank you so much for this opportunity to engage in, in, in this segment and, and over to you again, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Houston, and thank you very much for highlighting the importance of combating harmful practices and the importance of joint actions uh, to end these practices in our countries and globally. I think uh, Ms. Geiger has um, technical problems to join us. Uh, uh, if she's not with us, uh, we can move to our next uh, part of our meeting and later on we can give her a speech. So um, now um, we, can, we can move to uh, next dis distinguished guest, Ms. Jai Jani. 
Chinese female singer, actress, and dedicated advocate for girls' development, known as Summer. She was born in Yi, ethnic minority community in Sinchuan province of China. Since 2012, she has issued seven music albums, held a global concert tour, and won more, won more than 100 fashion and music awards. She is also an influential figure on Chinese social media with more than 15 million followers. She has been recognized as a role model for young girls. Uh, Miss Jenny is performing one of her advocacy songs as uh, she delivers a few words of insp inspiration um, to our policymakers present, of, uh, present at this um, event today. Please welcome the most inspirational part of our me meeting. Please. This song is for all girls who hold a dream, who want to love and be loved. This song is for you and FPA and people who are fighting for an equal world. Ms. Jenny, floor is yours for your remark. Thank you. Honorable Ministers, UNFPA, Deputy Executive Director, Dr. Diana Keita, respect speakers, friends, and colleagues. And the invitation of UNFPA, I am extremely honored to participate in this high-level interministerial dialogue on scaling up actions to end some preference and gender bias sex selection. My name is Chi Ke Chun Yi, a singer from China. And I am also a proud advocate for UNFPA's life-saving work for women and girls. Growing up to become who I am today, 
I have encountered many voices questioning the value of girls. When I started my career, people would say that only boys can eventually successful. What's the point for you to try so hard? However, when I won in national singing competitions and started having influence on social media, people called into questions again. Were these achievements really the result of her talent, persistence, and resilience? In present moment, I am on a TV show entitled Sisters Who Make Waves and we will present our final performance tomorrow night. As a group of females who are in our 30s, 40s, and even 50s, we play in this show in the hope that we could, ref that we could refute the social, con con sorry, the social consciousness in many Asian countries where it is believed that women in their midlives would become uncompetitive because their vibrancy declines with age. However, as one of female players in the show, I am so excited to see that more and more people realize and start to appreciate the equally important social and economic contributions that women make every day in varied sectors. Looking back at my own journey, I am proud to say that I have never stopped making effort in order to be successful in the career. I was indeed always fighting against the gender prejudice. I know that many girls around the world would not even have the chance to be in the battleground because of gender bias sex selection and some preference. This made me especially grateful for the opportunity that you gave to me today. According to the scientists' research, the normal sex ratio and birth ratio and birth ranges from 102 to 106 males per 100 males but this ratio becomes much higher than normal every day. We have to acknowledge that this is a form of discrimination caused by the gender inequality. As a female person myself, I would like to call on to put an end in this situation in our generation. I believe that a strong political commitment is needed in this action. Hereby, I would like to join UNFPA, European Commission, Government of Norway, and everyone in this dialogue to call on the decision make makers who are present today to make bold actions to ensure that girls can live a life with dignity and equality, just like the boys. Let's imagine that in 10 years, the world where those background will be turned into beautiful gardens in which everyone, boys and girls can thrive together. I hope that with our joint and continued efforts, this will become true very soon. Thank you very much for having me today. And I wish great success to this dialogue. Thank you. Ms. Janet, thank you very much for such amazing performance and inspiring words. words. And I thank you for your work and sharing your personal experience. Um, we really appreciate this. Um, I know that uh, Ms. Henriette Geiger still has some technical problems, but she can uh, deliver her remarks uh, whenever she, she will be able to uh, solve this technical problem. So I think that uh, uh, let me open the, there is still 
translation pro no yeah it's fixed uh, uh let me open the uh, first panel of this event which will focus on perspectives of academia and uh, first speaker uh, sorry i i hear russian translation at the same time uh, yeah uh and uh First speaker of this panel will be uh, Professor Christophe Zigilmoto, who is a senior fellow, fellow in demography at the French Research Institute for Development and is currently posted in New Delhi, India. He is one of the world experts on uh, prenatal sex selection and sex imbalances, and he has worked on India, China, Vietnam, as well as on Eastern Europe and the Caucasus, notably for UNFPA, the World Bank, and National Statistical uh, Institutes. Uh, Professor Christopher Zigilmoto will now take us through the global trends and current status of some preference and gender biased sex selection. Professor Gilmoto, floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Srilaje. Uh, hello to everyone. I'm uh, very honored to be invited to today's event. And I would like uh, to thank first uh, the UNFP and the Norwegian government for their support uh, provided to the fight against uh, gender bias sex selection. I'm also delighted that the honorable ministers from Azerbaijan, Bangladesh, India, and Nepal are among us today as well as the Minister of International Development of the Government of Norway, uh, whom I had the privilege to meet a year ago in New Delhi. Again, uh, thank you for your support and encouragement, uh, including for our research into this very important issue of uh, sex selection. And uh, without further ado, uh, let me move on with the next slide uh, of my presentation. And on that slide, you will see uh, a couple of definitions and some characteristics of uh, gender by sex selection. So it refers to the deliberate elimination of unborn female fetuses or babies on grounds of sun preference. And it is manifested firstly by the disproportionate number of boys among births, well above the biological level. The normal sex ratio at birth is around 103, 105, 106 male births per 100 uh, female births. But that ratio rose from its natural level uh, towards uh, high levels such as 110, 111, and even 130 in some regions, uh, which means 5 to 25% excess male births. And that happened uh, from the 1980s onwards in several countries of East and South Asia, uh, in South Caucasus as well, and in Southeastern, uh, Southeast Europe. And this increase is mostly caused by um, sex selective abortions, uh, that is prenatal sex uh, uh, diagnosis through ultrasound, followed by abortion of female fetuses. We shouldn't forget that uh, females also continue to suffer from excess female uh, mortality, especially during childhood, and that too due to um, gender discrimination. On the next slide, I will show you uh, on the next slide um, when it happened. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Here you can see that it started affecting um, South Korea, China, and India right from the 1980s. And then GBSS, gender by sex selection, was also became visible in Eastern Europe after the fall of the socialist regime in Southeast uh, Europe, as well as in the South Caucasus in the 1990s, and later on at the turn of the century in Vietnam and then in Nepal. And in some countries such as Pakistan or Bangladesh, we still have no strong evidence 
And in some other areas that I've shown also on the map, we simply have no sign of sex selection. That is the case, for instance, for Japan, for Thailand, for Iran, or for the Russian Federation. On the next slide, you will see the latest statistics of the sex ratio at birth. So once again, remember, it should be around 105, 106. And in these countries, it's often above 110, sometimes reaching 114. Uh, except for South Korea, where now it's back to normal at a level close to 105. Now, if you want, you could look at the uh, right part of my table and you will see the trend. And trends are mostly downward. There is only one country, uh, Nepal, for which we have limited statistical evidence in which there might be an increase as we speak. Otherwise, it is either stabilizing the level of the sex ratio at birth or it is uh, on the decline. On the next slide, you will see um, a summary of the trends. There are some bad news and good news. Bad news is that it may be still increasing in uh, Nepal, as I said before, or in parts of India, or in specific regions. But otherwise, we also know that there are countries in the Middle East or in Sub-Saharan Africa where the uh, GBSS might emerge in the future. Otherwise, in the rest of the world and in affected countries, we see that the sex ratio at birth has now stabilized at the plateau level or shows real signs of a sustained decline back to its normal biological level, close to 105. On the next slide, you will see uh, the story of South Korea. So I'm not going to talk more about it because my colleague, uh, John Iran, will talk about it. But you see, there is an increase with more and more people at the beginning, more and more people resorting to sex selection. Then there is a stabilization after 10 to 15 years. And finally, there is a slow decline of the proportion of male births back to a normal level. And this cycle has taken about 25 years in South Korea. Next slide. Uh, this slide will help you to understand why there is sex selection in the first place. So let's look at the three main factors behind it. First, in green, you have the technology, the fact that ultrasound, mostly ultrasound, has made possible for parents to know the sex of their child to be born in advance and to decide at times to abort it. A second factor in shown in blue is the fertility decline. The fact that more and more people have small families, so they have to make choice. And uh, when you have a small family, you have more chances to end up without a son. And having more children was in the past a way to ensure that the birth of a son, but this is far less common in these countries uh, today. And finally, in red, you have the root factor son preference. That is the fact that families in parts of the world absolutely insist on the birth of a son for family reasons. Because sons are essential for family perpetuation, name transmission, inheritance, in fact, for social status. But note that this is not the case in many Asian and European countries. Like, for example, I mentioned earlier Japan or Thailand, but I could add uh, Indonesia, or of course, uh, Germany, or even South India, or Western China. So in these areas, parents are equally happy with daughters or boys. 
Now, these are uh, three factors will help us to understand what will uh, happen in the future. On the next uh, slide, you can see their influence. For example, technology, to my sense, it's going to, the technology of sex selection, it's going to improve and it will be very difficult to regulate. So we cannot expect any change or any positive development on that front. For fertility, it is the same. Fertility is coming down and it's not going to rebound to a higher level. We've seen the case of uh, China recently. So there will be no change due to uh, our fertility, evol the evolution of fertility. Now, everything uh, will depend on the root factor. The solution for the reduction uh, in uh, GBSS comes from a, a gradual weakening of sun preference. First, because of increasing uh, female autonomy through education and employment, but thanks also to economic development and government policy, as my colleague Tang uh, Mengchu uh, is going to illustrate with the experience of China. Incidentally, uh, the situation is also demographically unsustainable due to the millions of excess young uh, men that may be unable to marry in countries like India and China. And then on my next uh, slide, uh, you can see indeed how the sex ratio at birth after increasing has declined in many countries after sometime 10 years or 15 years. You can see for instance, that Georgia, which is shown in black has followed the path of South Korea. And now the sex ratio at birth in Georgia is almost the biological level. Azerbaijan or China also show uh, signs of sustained decline after a long rise in their sex ratio at birth. The next slide, uh, next slide uh, sums up the situation. Um, you, you will see that first uh, the sex ratio uh, has uh, decline after increasing in several countries and that they are signs of improvement and or sometimes of stabilization like in Eastern Europe or also in uh, Vietnam where we've been able to study the result of the latest census of 2019. So as a summary uh, on my last slide, I show some of uh, what I see as the main challenges. First, uh, previous slide, please. Uh, first, um, ensuring that GBSS receives a broad recognition as a cruel, uh, harmful practice with long-term consequences. Um, to ensure that we devote more efforts to understanding both the persistence of sun preference in several uh, countries or regions, and also to its current decline, which is a very positive de uh, development. Uh, that we should also closely monitor trends and differentials so we know what's going on. And we need, I think, to strengthen the collection of civil registration data on births and on deaths too, uh, which is important to understand the evolution. And finally, uh, we need to share broadly across countries the best practices to eradicate GBSs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gilmoto, um, for a very interesting presentation. And let me present next speaker, Professor Hiran Chun, who is an associate professor of Jangwon University, South Korea, trained in heat demography and epidemiology at the Graduate School of Public Health, uh, Seoul National University. And he sh she has contributed to research projects on social um, determinants of health focusing on gender and the elderly. Her research uh, interests lie in women, gender and health and gender bias, sex selection and changes in child gender preferences. Ms. Chun will share us today the Korean experience. Ms. Chun, floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Good morning or good evening, everybody, depending on where you are now. 
My name is Hiran Chung from South Korea. I'm honored and happy to share the current experience with you, especially in light of a recent Women's Day. Can you see my slide? Yes. Next, please. The bell shape on the top right is the transitional model for the sex ratio at birth, SRB. South Korea is the first country to finish a unique SRB transition, which has occurred over the last three decades. Christopher um, explained this before. After experiencing SLB transition, a high level of SLB, the number came steadily down. In the empirical data, the SLB peaked in the 1990s, early 1990s, showing an SLB of 116. 0.5 in 1991. The SRB started to decline in the mid 1990s and became normalized in 2007. Since 2015, the SLB of even third born children or later had shown in the normal range. Next slide, please. My mission here today is to introduce the government policy designed to tackle gender bias sex selection in South Korea. I would also like to emphasize the importance of women's group activities and of Rona women themselves who broke with traditional values. Next slide, please. First, let's start with the policy interventions. The Korean government initiated social and legal measures toward gender equality in the 1970s, expanding to a more comprehensive social measure in 1981. The National Socioeconomic Development Plan had a section for policies to mitigate son preference. Of course, it was a part of family planning, altering the value of sons and daughters. The major included gender equality laws and the national pension scheme. Second, banning sex selective abortions. Despite the strong legal ban against sex selective abortions in South Korea, prenatal sex selection was not successfully prevented through legal interventions only. The years following the ban did not see a decline at first. And frequent cases of doctors violating the ban were not reported, nor were the doctors punished. However, over time, there was a positive and symbolic effect. Third, advocacy, BCC, IEC. Media campaigns were massively conducted from the 1970s by PPFK in South Korea. Little was known about the effect these campaigns had on the value of the Dora or the SLB change. But many Koreans, including myself, remember the advertising campaign entitled, next slide please, Regardless of Doro or son, have two children and bring them up well. This slide shows TV commercials in the 1970s with the campaign. Next slide, please. The following slide depicts posters and slogans in the 70s and in 1990s. Next slide, please. This picture on left, on the left, is showing women cheering for the abolition of the male headship system, Hojuje, in the Korean family law. It was abolished in 2005, but the movement started in the mid 1990s. Huh? What? This is different. You have 
the microphone. I, the next photo shows a representative of the Women's Association, E.E. Hoze, reading the declaration of using both parent surname. She, she is reading this on Women's Day in 1997. There's also mention of Ko Gang Sun, who led the movement, solving sex selective abortions and the revision of the family law were both crucial points of women's groups in the 1990s in South Korea. These women's groups fought for tackling the fundamental root of patrilineal society. Next slide, please. In conclusion, the known effects of these South Korean policies on SRB are limited. However, there have been government interventions, including social and legal measures, to improve women's status, as well as media campaign. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Ms. Ms. Uh, Heron, thank you very much for sharing Korean experience, and I'm sure we all found it very useful. And our next speaker is uh, Ms. Menjung Ten, who is a senior research fellow at China Population and Development Research Center, and her research interests include family and uh, fertility policy, gender, reproductive health, and family planning. She committed herself to um, several UNFPA China projects related to gender imbalance at birth at consultant, as consultant since 2011. Ms. Tan will be sharing with us today the China's actions and experience. Ms. Tan, floor is yours. Um, excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, can you, can you see my slides? Um, can you hear me? Sorry? Okay. It's my honor to present China's efforts and experience in addressing some preference and GBSS at this high level dialogue. Um, next, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. The SLB of China was first observed to be abnormal in 1982. It increased directly to a ping of 121.18 in 2004. Since 2009, the SRB has declined slowly, but sadly, and stood at 110 in 2019. Although it remains sweet today, the overall trend is expected to continue decline. Next, please. The cause of the squeeze SRB in China are similar with others, other countries. As for the decline, China's experience is to launch sweeping special actions across country to address this issue while promoting rapid social economy development and broadly empowering women. Next, please. Yeah. The firstly, the, chi the Chinese government attached great importance to the reduction of SRB. Over the past 20 years, efforts to, efforts to control the SRB uh, were all carried out under the legal framework. Um, uh, SRB reduction was frequently uh, included in population-related decisions made by the central government. Um, specific targets have also been set in the population-related national development plans. And China also established an effective working mechanism to address SRB, which is government-led and multi-sector involvement with strong monitoring and accountability mechanisms. A strategy of crisis fight guidance, focuses control and phased implementation was also adopted. In a large country like China with a vast territory and a large population, this strategy is proved to be practical and successful. A national action plan called Care for Girl Action has been launched since 2005 to cover SRB. China 
also improve the quality of data, the data of birth to ensure reliable data for evidence-based policy making. Next, please. Yeah. Secondly, uh, promote, uh, secondly, equally between men and women is one of China's basic national policies. Um, the government development policies and formulated law to protect women's rights and interests in the economy, education, health, social security, and their participants in decision making. National program for the development of Chinese women has been releasing every 10 years to set forth a broad array of specific goals and in indicators for promoting women's development. Also, local governments have introduced a number of policies that gave priority to families with only daughters in terms of schooling, employment, land, housing, and so on. As a result, women's data in China has been improved dramatically. For example, China has uh, basically eliminated the gender difference in nine years compulsory education. Furthermore, the number of highly educated women has increased significantly with proportion already topping 50%. Next, please. Yeah. Third, broad social publicity was launched to change the social norm, let's shape a couple's preference for songs. At community level, Mobilization and gender awareness raising activities are conducted. Traditional custom having a, ph a phenomenon of preferring song to daughter had been transformed. Village rules has been revised to enable gender equality to take root in village. Next, please. Um, fourth, uh, measure to control accessibility to technology. A fetal sex determination and sex selection pre-pregnancy termination for non-medical purpose are illegal in China. We call them to illegalities. The government strengthens the education of medical personnel, a severely published note engaged in the two illegalities and regulated the use of technology. Next, please. Um, for more information, please refer to an upcoming report which unfold a clear trajectory of how China responds to its squeeze SRB. China's SRB is nonetheless still imbalanced. Looking forward, there is still a long way to go. I would like to take this opportunity to thank UNFPA for their vision, support, and excellent partnership working with China to address this issue over the last decades. And I'm looking forward to more experience sharing activities in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ten. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience. Um, now I would like to check uh, if Ms. Henriette Geiger is with us, the Director of People and Peace Directorate at the European Commission. Ms. Geiger, I, I'm sorry that you had some technical problems. And if you are here, please take the floor for your remarks. Yes, thank you very much. And I'm, uh, I want to apologize to all the participants I had serious uh, signing in issues, um, but I followed as a participant the deliberations. I just didn't have any speaking or camera rights. So I followed you and thank you very much for the interventions already made. I'm, um, I'm the director here in the European Commission responsible for uh, people in peace and in, in, uh, in DG INPA International Partnership, so Development Corporation, including responsible also for gender issues and health issues. So um, thank you very much for allowing the European Union to speak at this, uh, at this, the, this is no longer the opening, at this session and to participate in, in such a sensitive discussion on one of the most little known and yet so widespread and devastating harmful practices for the well-being of women and girls. 
referring to have a son instead of a daughter and being capable to defy nature at birth to do so seems to be the height of gender-based discrimination. <coughs> son preference and resulting practices are deeply rooted in social norms and stereotypes across cultures and patriarchal family structures where girls are notoriously undervalued. It is to counteract this influence that the EU is strongly advocating for gender transformative approach in all external policies and sect sectors. We do this inter alia through some, an instrument called Gender Action Plan 3, which is committing not only all the EU institutions, so all we do in terms of development cooperation and all other policies of the EU, for example, on peace and security, but it is also committing our member states um, to establish gender equality through whatever we do. So emphasizing the value of girls by addressing GBSS is central to our engagement in the same way as its fight against other harmful practices, just such as female genital mutilation and child marriage. Numerous policy documents address the issue of harmful practices and openly condemn them, both within and outside EU countries. To name only one of the most recent commitments, so our recent EU action plan on human rights and democracy, the EU gender action plan three that I just mentioned, and now new and upcoming is our EU strategy on the rights of the child. They all call for the elimination, prevention and protection from harmful gender norms and practices, including infanticides and son preference at birth. Harmful practices such as GPSS are a fundamental violation of human rights and they put women and girls' sexual and reproductive health and rights at great risk. As part of the 2021 Generation Equality Forum, the EU and leaders called on new concrete action steps, including empowering women and girls to make and act on their own decisions about their sexual and reproductive lives by changing norms to exercise their bodily autonomy and rights. Political commitments against gender-based violence and harmful practices must be followed by concrete action, which is why since 2016, the EU has been supporting the UNFPA global program to prevent sun preference and gender bias sex selection. In this regard, let me announce that the EU contribution for the second phase of this program with UNFPA, which is 2 million euro, will be signed still this month. It is actually a matter of only a few days. As with any issue, the participation and commitment of partner countries is crucial to achieving tangible results and progress. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity today to share with you and to hear highlights of efforts done so far and actions to further address the issue of GPSS. What we can do is encourage each other by sharing good examples and practices and have like that a strong coalition which is more than ever needed. Um, I just wanted to tell you that um, my commissioner, so this is our minister for international cooperation, has a very strong commitment to gender equality and human rights. 
So she will be a very strong ally in our joint fight. So you can count us in and you can continue to rely on us. And I would just like to take this opportunity to thank you and FPA for its tireless efforts to combat harmful practices in general and GBSS in particular. The EU will always support initiatives in this direction, and I encourage the donors to mobilize for this cause, which unfortunately still ravages too many countries and seriously affects the value and confidence of girls. But I would also like to say, concluding here, that of course, uh, this practice, the sun preference practice, is also um, a cultural expression and an expression of poverty. And we should never forget that when we look at the issue, because just prohibiting by law will not do the trick as long as people are not convinced that this is not the right thing to do, they will find a way to do it. So we have to be smart in combining our tools and also allow those families who still consider it to consider an alternative without condemning them or judging them, offering them an alternative. So I think in that sense, I would like to conclude. So thank you very much for letting me in. And once again, my apologies for disrupting the flow of the conference. It was all involuntary. Thank you very much. Ms. Geiger, I thank you very much for your words and for your intervention. Um, dear colleagues, I just uh, want to announce that we may extend our meeting by five minutes since we started a bit late, so I would like to apologize. And uh, uh, we now move, move on to the next panel and our honorable representatives of the member states will share the, their country perspectives on sound preference and gender bias sex uh, selection. While I acknowledge that all member states present here today um, have done uh, extensive work in addressing this issue, by, but uh, due to the tight schedule, uh, presentations might not be uh, by all. And also I would like to highlight that um, His Excellency, Mr. Zahid Melek, um, is having access issues and uh, the, the uh, Minister of Health and Family Welfare in the national government of Bangladesh is having access issues and he, could, he couldn't join us. So um, let, me allow, let, let me allow to move on to our next speaker. And our next speaker is His Excellency, Mr. Raidesh Tripathi, who is the Minister for Health and Population in Nepal. He served uh, as a Minister for Federal Affairs and General Administration. Earlier to this, he served as a Minister for Law, Justice and Parliamentary Affairs, having served the House of Representative members in 2017. Uh, you have five minutes, Honorable Minister, to share your, uh, the policy actions of Government of Nepal in addressing some preference and gender bias sex selection. Please, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ekaterina. Uh, <clears throat> distinguished uh, participants, honorable ministers, uh, let me thank uh, UNFPA and European Commission, Norwegian government for providing me this opportunity to share uh, the view of Nepal with uh, other participants. Increase three determinants of imbalance, key decline, easy access to sex, determination technology, and some preference are evident in our country. Studies and research conducted has confirmed 12 hot spots districts where SRB ratio is imbalanced. There is a stronger, strong pressure on women to bear a son, which hampers her right to choice, health, and may even lead to violence. In a patri patriarchal power structure, gender bias, sex selection, 
DBSS in favor of sons in a manifestation of gender inequality in Nepal that is deeply embedded by tradition, culture, religion, social, economic, and legal injustice, injustice that un undervalue girls and women. This is across all culture and religion and is coupled with traditions like Dori and laws around inheritance, which undervalue girls, hence require a multi-dimensional approach to programs. There is a positive legal framework, for example, the Constitution of Nepal, Civil Code, Penal Code, and Safe Motherhood and Reprodu Reproductive Health uh, Rights Act. But despite constitutional and legal guarantees, ensuring gender equality and non-discrimination on the basis of sex and gender, Nepalese women face discrimination in various walks of life. Laws and positive legal framework alone cannot address this multidimensional issue and require us to holistically understand that unless there is an equal value of girls and boys, socially and economically, this cannot be addressed. In the context of Nepal, the availability of technologies for the early determination of sex has been perceived as a tool for sex selection. However, a law criminalizing GBSS with a specific focus on sex selection, abortion is superficial as social change in attitudes towards girls and women have a larger role. Controlling technology and restricting laws against abortion would only perpetuate further victim victimization of women where women resort to unsafe and clandestine abortions endanger their life and health and may even lead to violence. Nepal is proud of its achievement on the development of national strategy on GBSS. The st strategy was developed by an active steering committee through a number of multi-stakeholder cons consultations. This strategy is an important step towards it forced to meet the need of sustainable development goals, target, and associated indicators, SDG 3, 4, and 5, towards ensuring inclusive and equi equitable society. As a lead agency, Ministry of Health and Population is committed to work with other line ministries in the implementation of strategy towards addressing the overall root cause of GBSS, that is, work towards eliminating, yeah, eliminating discrimination against girls and women in all sectors. This will be done with focus on awareness raising campaigns, community mobilization and outreach. Invest on capacity building for women and adolescents for their meaningful participation in public and political life and implement policies for affirmative actions. Thank, thank you, thank you all, thanks all participants. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, Mr. Tripathi, thank you very much. And our next speaker is Ms. Gahramanova Sadakat, who has been the Deputy Chairman of State Committee for Family, Women and Children Affairs of the Re Republic of Azerbaijan since 25. Ms. Gahramanova has held a number of leadership positions at the Party Committee, Executive Committee, National Control Committee, and etc. Ms. Gahramanova, may I kindly ask you to deliver highlights of Azerbaijan actions and um, in, in five minutes. Floor is yours. Министры и участники мероприятия, я от души приветствую вас и желаю успехов нашему форуму. Как уже было сказано, проблема селективных абортов остается одной из актуальных проблем. И статистические данные показывают, что соотношение полов детей с годами меняется. Если в 2011-2014 годах на каждые 100 девочек приходилось 116 мальчиков, то в 2019 году этот показатель снизился до 114. Правительство Азербайджана в тесном сотрудничестве и партнерстве с ЮНЕФПА 
в Азербайджане проводит рад мероприятий с целью решения проблемы предпочтения сыновей и гендерного неравенства посредством подготовки базы для принятия решений и разработки соответствующих механизмов для повышения осведомленности среди населения и изменения восприятия проблемы. Первая всеобъемлющая оценка изменения соотношений полов при в Азербайджане была проведена в 2018 году отделением фонда ООН в области народного населения ЮНИФПА в Азербайджане и Государственным комитетом по вопросам семьи, женщин и детей. Гендерное равенство и гендерные отношения в Азербайджане. Для изучения социально-демографических факторов и выявления причин селективных абортов. Также в 2019 году совместно с Азиатским банком развития была проведена гендерная оценка страны, где вопросам селективных абортов было уделено особое внимание. Оценка была посвящена исключительно изучению механизмов, лишающих в основе этого явления и использованием как имеющихся количественных, так и качественных данных. В ходе данного исследования были выявлены социально-демократические факторы, стоящие за изменением соотношений полов при рождении, а также изучены причины, лежащие в основе этого явления. Оба исследования позволили разработать соответствующие программы и мероприятия. Решением Кабинета министров от 24 февраля 2020 года был принят национальный план действий на 20-25 годы по предотвращению выбора пола ребенка до рождения, а также в принятой государственной программе по народонаселению в демографии за 18-30 годы были включены положения по проведению соответствующих мероприятий и мониторинга по решению проблемы неравенства полов в Азербайджане. В стране проводятся стратегические мероприятия, направленные на эффективное и действительное осуществление мер, закрепленных в национальном плане действий для решения проблем предпочтительного отношения родителей к сыновьям и усиления ценностей девочек в нашей стране. В целях дальнейшего содействия укрепления научно обоснованной национальной политики и программ, направленных на решение проблем селективных абортов, в Азербайджане Госкомитетом и ЮНИФПА провели гендерную оценку социальной политики по достижению гендерного равенства в стране. Были разработаны рекомендации по усилению работы государственных структур в этом направлении и повышению осведомленности населения. При поддержке ЮНИФПА были осуществлены следующие мероприятия среди представителей гражданского общества, религиозных общин и среди массовой информации. Был проведен фестиваль «Отцы и дочери», где молодые мужчины, будущие отцы, выступали в качестве главных пропагандистов и девочки и бросали вызов патриархальным устоям укрепляя решающую роль отца в расширении прав и возможностей девочек. Религиозные группы и лидеры местных общин были привлечены с целью использования роли религии в борьбе с вредными практиками в регионах Азербайджана. Знаменитости демонстрировали свою поддержку расширению прав и возможностей женщин и отстаивали ценность девочки. Согласно инструкции Минздрава, Назвать пол, плод в утробе матери при обследовании и делать аборты по половому признаку было в Азербайджане запрещено. Но контроль над данным вопросом следует, безусловно, усилить. Проведены семинары для представителей средств массовой информации по вопросам селективного аборта. Было разработано пошаговое руководство по гендерно-чувствительной журналистики. В рамках продолжения мер, принимаемых Государственным комитетом по вопросам семьи, женщин и детей, направленных на предотвращение дискриминации по признаку пола, до рождения ребенка и снижение 
предпочтение отдаваемых мальчикам в семьях. Мы начали кампанию под названием «Скажем Также в целях привлечения внимания общественности к вопросам селективных абортов Госкомитет с молодежными общественными объединениями «Надежное будущее» размещаются информационные плакаты в общественном транспорте. Впервые в Азербайджане планируется открытие школ для отцов в рамках программы ЕС за гендерное равенство вместе против гендерных стереотипов. Правительство намерено продолжить программные и просвещение населения о вредах селективных абортов, тщательно изучать и сократить масштабы этого явления. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very, very much, Ms. Kahramanova. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience. Dear participants, we had an opportunity to listen to wonderful presentations made, made by honorable speakers from member states. Uh, before I give the floor to Her Excellency, Ms. Diana Keita, for keynote address, as requested by the organizers, please allow me to present highlights of the proposed 10 points call to action. The dialogue is just an entry point to take this forward at country levels. Um, so, uh, first is acknowledge that ministers need to ensure that sharing of annual estimates on the extent and local variations of sex imbalances at birth. Two, commit to create a social, economic and political atmosphere of equality between men and women, girl and boys, and respect, protect and fulfill the human rights of women and girls. Third, Recognize the need to set up an international cooperative observatory of sound preference and gender biased sex selection in Asia and Europe for monitoring trends and assessing the social and demographic impact of sex imbalances at birth. Four, commit to allocate sufficient and long-term financial and technical resources for preventing sound preference and gender biased sex selection programs for addressing the deep-rooted and structural issues related to gender discrimination. Five, recognize that ministers, uh, recognize that ministers and other senior policymakers should put into practice actions that broaden and intensify cooperation between and among states, local governance, and civil society organizations on integrating services for addressing some preference and gender bias sex selection in national, regional, and global response to COVID-19 and other emergencies and humanitarian crises. Six, recognize that ministers need to promote the el elimination of gender bias in all society, including within the family context. Seven, recognize the role of ministers to support the creation of knowledge hub for governments and other national lectors to share policy experience in relation to some preference and gender biased sex selection initiatives across countries. This, this could include launching a platform for regular exchange of knowledge and good practices by the governments and other national actors. Reaffirm that ministers should ensure that law against some preference and gender biased sex selection remain grounded and aligned with international human rights. Nine, Recognize the need to take actions that address the deep-rooted preferences for uh, male offspring and which promote the equal value of girls that can be contextualized across countries. As part of this efforts, institute, uh, institute policies that protect women's sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights and ensure they are translated into national laws and policies and enforce through local action plans. And 10, agree to include the reporting on sound preference and gender biased sex selection indicators as part of 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, now I'm very delighted to present the Assistant Secretary General and UNFPA Deputy Executive Director for Program, Her Excellency, Ms. Diana Keita. Prior to the role, Ms. Keita served as a Minister for Cooperation and African Integration of Guinea and has over 30 years of experience working with the United Nations. 
she has had a series of uh, senior manager management positions. Uh, today, when delivering on her keynote to address, Ms. Keita will call on honorable ministers and uh, to consider the call to actions proposed at interministerial level to end some preference and gender bias sex selection. Your Excellency, Ms. Keita, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Dear Madam Moderator, dear Ekaterin, your Excellency, Minister Orstein from Norway, Your Excellency, Zahed Malik from Bangladesh. Your Excellency, Tripathi from Nepal. Madam Geiger, Director from the European Union. Madam Gadramanova, Deputy Chair, State Committee for Family and Women Affairs of Azerbaijan. Professor Gilmoto, Professor Chun, Professor Tang. Dear Jaiki, our amazing star, artist, singer, Tetsi, you are such a role model for young girls. All honorable ministers, ambassadors, hereby present, esteemed colleagues and friends. It gives me great pleasure to address this virtual gathering of the 65th Commission for the Status of Women. I'm looking forward to listening to member states experience that we have just done now and action to address some preference and the undervaluing of girls that can manifest in gender bias selection. I thank you all so much for this productive interministerial dialogue, highlighting good practices and call to action. The bold political commitment demonstrated here today is another milestone to addressing women's reproductive health and rights and contribution toward the realization of the Sustainable Development Goal 5.3. This will have a real effect in our partnership. Together, we shall prevent all forms of harmful practices and ensure a protective environment that is free from gender discrimination and denial of women and girls' human rights. I particularly noted the pertinent issues raised by member states hereby present and the very enlightening presentation by Professor Christopher Giltimo and the great lessons shared by Professor Chun on the South Korea experience. I heard as well the passion and support from Honorable Minister Halstein from Norway and the renewed commitment for close partnership from Madame Geiger of the European Union. We are so grateful. The sustained partnership of the European Commission and the government of Norway to end all form of harmful practices is invaluable to our collective battle on achieving gender equality and women's sexual reproductive health and rights. Some results of this partnership on addressing son preference and gender bias sex selection include, but are not limited to, data availability, advocacy, and knowledge management. That has contributed to policy review and development, legislative reforms, including costed national plan in most countries and South-South cooperation. Distinguished delegates and colleagues, today we continue to be faced with such a situation where the economic inequalities are reinforced by many other forms of inequalities and the current pandemic has further exacerbated these inequalities. On behalf of the United Nations, I do hereby reaffirm our commitment to provide holistic support to ensure women and girls protection from all types of gender discrimination and harmful practices. I commit to support the interministerial action which are very comprehensively articulated in the declaration that we are all about to adopt. And as a former minister myself, I commend the member states 
and partner present here today. Thank you for leading the way in ending harmful practices. We stand with women, girls, and ensure to leave no one behind. I now call on all member states hereby present to join us as we move forward with the call to action presented here. The call to action for our sustained declaration of commitment to continue efforts towards the end of some preference and gender biases selection. This dialogue does not end today. It is a continuous process. I thank you all for your kind attention. Your Excellency, Ms. Keita, thank you very much for your wonderful words. Uh, distinguished participants, we had many participants that have made engagement via chat, but due to the time constraints, uh, we will record the chat box and later on we will be sharing uh, with you. And also I would like to uh, thank you all of you for joining today's event and especially let me gratitude uh, for our uh, for our um, interesting guests and excellent presentations ma made by them. I would like to thank all the member states for the timely involvement at the dialogue. And I would like to extend my appreciation to the UNFPA, the Deputy Executive Director, Ms. Deina Kieta, and Regional Directors, teams, the country office staffs, um, our interpreters and sign language interpreters, the IT support, and everyone who could join today's meeting. Um, and uh, once again, I'm, I'm sure that uh, today's event is a very good basis uh, for future advocacy in this, in this, in this uh, issue. And uh, I personally feel humbled to have moderated this very important dialogue. We shall all work together to see the full implementation of the 10 point sections voice it here today. Thank you very much once again and have a nice day.